Welcome to the Maverick Paradox podcast, where we explore what it is to be a maverick and discover effective modes of leadership. I am Judith Germain, and my mission is to propel the maverick mindset into a world where character and integrity will ultimately have a higher premium than personality and bureaucracy. So thank you for joining me on this journey. And if you would like to continue with me, then please download future episodes on iTunes. But today I want to talk to Ian Chambers, who's the Managing Director of Affinity Flying Training Services Limited. Welcome, Ian. Hi, uh, hi, Jude. Good to speak to you and everyone else. Really looking forward to our conversation today. Um, I look after Affinity Flying Training Services, which is a an organisation, small, medium enterprise organisation employing about 100 people uh, who build and provide aeroplanes to the UK Ministry of Defence. We're a startup. We've been going since February last year. We're very much storming at the moment. Uh, and leadership's a very important topic for me right now. Yeah, I guess it is. I mean, it must be quite different. I saw from your website that you used to um, work for the RAF. So how is leadership? Is leadership the same in military as it is in civilian life? Well, I guess it's closer than we than we might think. Um, a lot of people, when you think about military leadership, think about uh, command and control and people telling other people what to do. Uh, military leadership has developed an awful lot since uh, since those days, and it's a very collaborative approach to leadership. Uh, the armed forces in general uh, employ uh, highly intelligent people, uh, technicians and so on, to, to, to deliver for them, and therefore those people uh, demand and have a right to know the whys about issues as well as the what to do. So I think actually leadership is very close, a lot closer in, between the military and uh, and civilian areas than, than, than we might have first thought. Yeah, I've always found it interesting that um, Simon Sinek talks a lot about military leadership. Um, and he talks about that the leaders in the military look after their, their crew far better than managers in civilian life. Have you found that as well? So it varies from organisation to organisation and environment to environment, uh, I, I think. Um, I, I've got a pretty simple view about this, is that, that, that uh, the leaders are there to support the people and enable them to do their role, not not the other way around. So I think the organisations that don't work uh, in the way I've just described are probably losing some competitive advantage. They are potentially not as efficient as they might be, and they've probably got, I'll put money on it, a higher turnaround in organisations that take a slightly different view, which is everyone is part of one team and we just have different roles. Yeah, I mean, that makes quite a lot of sense. Um, the work that I do is around mavericks who I've defined as willfully independent people and socialised mavericks, I say, are the better, um, the more developed leaders. And one of the things about socialised mavericks is that they have a high sense of integrity and social justice and have a strong moral fibre. The work that I've seen um, you do makes me feel that very strongly that you're a socialised maverick. Does that make sense to you? Uh, it might, it might do. I've been, I've been called many things in my life. Um, and I think socialized maverick is a, is, is a good one. Uh, certainly uh, it feels to me that, um, there's a few kind of characteristics I have and other leaders have that, that might fall into that category. And if you look at, um, the way I might describe myself as energetic, uh, come focused and co- collaborative, you can see how that might tie into some of the wider descriptions you, you, you make of, uh, of, of what a socialized maverick is. I, th- I think you're right. I think the natural state for a socialised maverick is to collaborate, um, which makes perfect sense if you want to lead someone. The other things that, that mavericks are drawn towards is novelty. Um, they hate routine. Is that something that you can um, engage with? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I mean, for you, consider my current business. I think it, we must be populated by socialised mavericks because pretty much everyone who joined us from February last year until now are joining a small medium enterprise from mostly larger corporates, mostly larger organizations, and uh, every single one of us is here because we want the chance to start a business up from scratch, to put in, to make it the business we want to make it. And that's something that actually I think that none of us have ever done before. So novelty is, is high on what we're doing right now. It's quite a brave act, isn't it, to move away from You've got the military, and then you and then you moved into corporate world, and then to move out. What really made you want to leave the corporate cocoon and do your own thing? 
Well, I think I, I'm, I'm like a lot of people. Um, so corporates are good and they have, and they have a lot of strengths and kind of things going for them that smaller businesses don't do, such as, uh, leverage around capital and they have a large workforce, which allows them to be, if, they, if they're structured well, flexible and, and relatively responsive. Um, the key thing for me as a small medium enterprise is that all of the things that I complained about that weren't right when I was working in other organizations, and it's the same for all my colleagues who joined Affinity since then, we have a chance to put together the organization that we've always wanted to work for. Uh, and although there is some risk involved in that, and there's, there's risk involved in pretty much every time you um, you move from one organization to another, uh, we understand the risks in this environment pretty well. They're well-defined. Um, technically, we understand what we're doing. And then the challenges for us now are how we build high-performing teams that trust each other, uh, that can work through the stresses and strains of setting up a new business, and with a fairly demanding customer as well. And I think that's why we're that's why we're here, because it's, it's different and it's challenging. And that's the thing that brings, I think, most of us to work every day. Yeah, I, I can understand that, because one of the things about with Mavericks, if they have no challenge, it's like they have no oxygen and they can't breathe. Um, and organisations, large organisations, tend to forget that. Um, they bring a maverick in because they want them to you know, change the world. And once they've changed the world, they then want to smother smother that oxygen. Is, was there ever a frustration with you with that? To some extent, yes. In some of the roles I've had, there is a bit of... Um... The corporate way is the corporate way, regardless of the business environment that you happen to be working on, your particular business unit or or contract. And that can be frustrating in that sometimes it may not let you deliver the best service to your customer, who at the end of the day are the people who um, pay us and who we deliver service to. So that, that, that can be a little bit frustrating. Um, equally in the organization that we've just started up, although it's ours and we own it, uh, we do have customers we need to service as well. And we, we, we genuinely believe here that we understand their needs well and we'll be able to deliver to them something that they wouldn't get necessarily from a larger organisation. Makes That makes a lot of sense. How, in, how important is character to you when you're recruiting? Completely. I mean, one of the great things that we've had since we set the business up last year is that we've been able to, um, to pick our family uh, and although we have had some amazing candidates come and ask and look to join us uh, over the past um, 20 months or so, we've been able to choose people who we think will best fit in to the environment that we have, as well as being technically excellent. So character from that point of view is is really important. But what I also think is important uh, when we talk about talk about character is also um, and, uh, and, uh, and a lot of people kind of think about character and then try and pigeonhole people into a particular way for a particular organization. The key th to me is because we are small, and it may sound rather kind of contradictory to start with, having people with different characters and different personalities in the business is also really important to us because that's the way we generate internal challenge and continuous improvement. And we've got some strong-willed people in here. But the other thing I see is with strong wills and the type of characteristics we talked about also comes a willingness to learn and improve and take a different point of view if someone provides the evidence that actually your position may not be the one that will deliver the service best. So it's, it's really quite exciting from that point of view. We haven't got it right yet, and we probably won't have it right for a few years. And then when we do get it right, we'll need to improve on it again. Thank you. That's such a refreshing attitude. Um, people always try to craft a culture and then once they have a culture, they just want to keep it like that forever without realising that the environment itself changes. How how important is having fun in your workplace? Um, very important uh, for us. I think we want to, so we want people to want to come to work in the morning and I think that's that's important. We have had limited activities to go and enjoy each other's company over the past 18 months because we've been starting up, but when we have had them, really important to me, they've been all company, not just a few bunch of leadership team members or a particular department. So everything we do today has been all company because at the end of the day, we're all delivering to the customer and we're all important delivering the service. So so fun is good. And also fun comes in, in lots of different ways as well, doesn't it? You know, it's about the about the environment you set in the business. So you can actually come to work and do nothing that other people might consider fun, but actually enjoy your time at work because the environment is good. It allows you to grow. It allows you to relax. We uh, we take a, 
a different view about time management and so on. You know, we we're, we're about delivery, not not just FaceTime here. And when people don't need to be here, they don't need to be here because they can go and see their, their families and kind of enjoy time with them as well. So fun comes in different ways and we try and do it together when we can and then kind of create an environment where people feel relaxed and not under pressure and doing their and doing their work during the working day. Brilliant. Thank you. I mean, I find that interesting because in my book, The Maverick Paradox, The Secret Power Behind Successful Leaders, one of the things I say about leading mavericks is to allow them to work on their own time scales. And that's one of the things I've noticed a lot in corporate world is that they expect mavericks to work, say, a nine to five when the maverick knows that they can be more productive at three o'clock in the morning to seven o'clock in the morning. So they might want to come in late the next day because they're tired um, and then find that they're restricted. Yeah, and it, you know, it's um, that's always a challenge, I think. Um, and if I take our business in particular, you know, we uh, we deliver airplanes on the line for a customer who works particular hours of the day is, is the 85% part of our job. So those guys are constrained uh, to shift patterns um, that we kind of make as flexible as we can for them. Equally within the business, we have elements of the business whose job it is, is to think strategically about the way we manage fleet that we have and how we deliver the service to the customer. And I'll look at those guys in particular and sometimes they're here, sometimes they're not, sometimes they're late in, sometimes they're early in. And I really don't care as long as they're producing an output. But I think more importantly for me, and this is a really important thing if you to integrate Mavericks into your business effectively, is that the rest of the business also need to see the fruits of their labor. So it's important that when you give people flexibility to deliver things, you also take the time and also allow them to take the time to, to tell people what they've done. In our case, that's often quite obvious because it comes in the form of a strategy or a particular note or a technical note which has been well thought through which then permeates through the business and you can see the work that's been done but i think in some other organizations mavericks are perhaps not as welcome as others because it looks as if they have special privileges and people don't see what they actually do so letting people know what you do but also as a leader as a business leader making sure that people know what everyone else is contributing to the business is really really important because that's the way you generate a strong team ethos with people of different types and different paratalities and different characteristics in the business at the same time. Makes sense. And I think it's it's a big problem with, with organisations because I think a lot of managers are very poor leaders. So they can't, they, if they can't see you, they feel they can't manage you and then it becomes a trust issue. I don't know whether Ian is actually working hard. Maybe he's out shopping. Maybe I should just keep phoning him up and seeing what he's actually, let's bring him back in the workplace. And that can really undermine any good that's been um, garnered. Yeah. And it's, so it's common. That's a common problem, uh, Jude, across businesses large and small in that we, um, we find ways to reward people who have done a good job. Often the only way we find in companies sometimes is to promote them in to a leadership or a senior managerial role. And then often the organization then forgets to support them as they start to grow into that role. So they're left to flounder and they become they become inevitably poor leaders because they're struggling to deliver that leadership role because no one's helped them to do it. So I think we've got a um we've got a duty of care to if you use that term or a duty to our people as we bring them through the organization to also make sure we support them and we can do that in many different ways through mentoring training coaching uh to to enable them to deliver their potential as leaders or if they're not a natural leader find another way to reward them for what they've done uh, and there are many ways there are many ways we we can do that as well so i think it's it's important we mustn't forget people and we mustn't um really important to me we mustn't punish people for positions that we as senior managers and leaders put them into that's not their fault it's our job to coach them bring, bring them bring them through whether they're mavericks or whether they're not mavericks because they all deserve the chance yes and uh, wow that is um enlightening and um, people keep thinking that when they delegate when you delegate you actually delegate authority but you can never delegate responsibility and it sounds a bit trite but that's the fact you know if you've delegated some work to an employee and they have failed it's because you didn't delegate properly Often the case, I mean, we uh, we talk quite a lot in our business about roles and responsibilities and clarity therein. So that 
you get that right, a number of things happen. People can deliver the things that you've delegated down to them. Things don't get lost in the cracks in the business. But more importantly, you empower then individuals within the delegations you've given them and the roles and responsibilities you give them to go and deliver stuff. And that does a number of things. It means the business is successful and the tasks that it's due to do. But you also develop confidence in the individuals that they can do things without someone looking over their shoulder and telling them what to do because actually you've made it easy for them to deliver. And that in itself then grows people through your business and allows them to become senior managers and leaders in their own right as well. Brilliant. That is very, very true. So here's a question for you. What what can a large organisation or a more typical organisation do to support the mavericks in their myths? I think you need to um, take a, a, a different view to to outcomes and delivery. Um, if we always take a view that the way I've done it before is the way it will be done in the future, then you, by definition, stifle people who do things slightly differently. You stifle probably uh, innovative approaches to delivering great services to our customers, and that has a negative effect on your business because you're seen as a one-trick pony. Um, People don't want to come back to you because you can't deliver well. So I think, to my mind, this is all about left and right of arcs for individuals in which to deliver, but left and right of arcs that give them scope to express themselves. As often as you can, give them clear delegations and allow them to do something, even if it's not quite the way you or the organisation would do it yourself. Uh, and also then, I think lastly, back to the point I made earlier on, is celebrate what people deliver in the organisation publicly so we can all see that although I'm doing a particular role in a particular way, someone else is doing something de- different but in a different way and they're also getting results for our business, not just my part of the company. I think it's really important to me. You know, businesses should be owned um, by the people who who are in them, not just by the leadership at the top. Because once we take ownership of our business, we will then start to deliver really, really, really good, thoughtful services to our customers who, at the end of the day, are the people that, that we're in business for. And I think this is really important, you know, allow the business to grow, to find its own way, give it some guidance, kind of be essentially someone at the at the wheel of the ship, just moving the rudder left and right a little bit, but allow people to express themselves and you get a far better output from them than you would if you just say it's this way or no way at all. Brilliant. That's really, really good. And I'd like to thank you for your thoughts on lead on leadership and Mavericks. So, Ian, if people wanted to contact you or find out more about their business, how would they do that? Hey, we've got a uh, we've got a website like about five million other people as well. But our website, if you just type in Affinity Flying Training Services, you'll you'll find us, and you can contact us uh, contact us through there. And if you want to speak to me, just uh, just put on the email address that you want to contact me about leadership, and I'll be happy to get in touch. Thank you, Ian, so much. It's been a pleasure to have you on, and I hope you'll come back again and share your expertise. Great. Thank you, Jude. Really good to speak to you. Bye for now. Bye. Thank you once again for tuning into the Maverick Paradox podcast. I hope you have enjoyed listening. If you would like to learn more about Mavericks and leadership, then please subscribe to my podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, or one of the other popular podcast platforms. Alternatively, apply to join the Maverick Paradox exclusive Facebook group. My website is maverickparadox.com. Find out how willful independence can ultimately change all our futures. Thanks again and see you soon.